the dark of the midnight have I oft hid my face while the storm howls above me and there's no hiding place amid the crash of the thunder precious Lord hear my cry and keep me safe till the storm passes by till the storm Tomorrow I'm going to rise where the storm never darkens the sky. Yeah. 
Amen. If you will, take your hymnal tonight. Turn to page 24. The old rugged cross had several uh, requests for this one. Let's stand tonight. We're going to have the ladies sing on the third verse. So all four verses of the old rugged cross, page 24.
chord. So I'll share. God's people said, amen. amen. Turn around and shake hands one with another, smile and wave if you're not able to before you're seated as our pastor comes. My, that's where the victory is yes. in the cross. That's where the Son, the perfect Son of God, took all of our sins. That's right. All of our problems, yes. all of these things, and nailed them to his cross. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Our sins yes. are gone. Yes. Whew. Glory. Go ahead, Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank God and the Lamb forever for taking a sinner like me. We were talking a while ago, Brother Steve, and then some of us in the prayer room, Brother Ron, different ones about, you know, we have some imperfections. We fail. We make mistakes. But you know what? The cross covers it all. Yes. Amen. I'm not excusing sin one bit. No, I'm not. I hate sin. But I just want to tell you, when you do sin or make a mistake, after you're saved, the blood takes care of you. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. And it means a continual cleansing. Amen and amen. Yes, sir. We can thank God for the cross, sing about it, praise God for it, and I don't believe God minds it at all. I know He's pleased, and I'm praying. And I prayed right here tonight while we're worshiping God, Lord, let this be acceptable in thy sight. Let it be something that you're pleased with the way we're worshiping you tonight. Well, thank you for being here. We're happy to be see you tonight. Welcome to everybody. If you're visiting for the first time, lift up your hand and let the ushers bring you a card. Get a card, if you will, please, and fill it out. Drop it in the offering bag in a little bit. Have several. We appreciate that. Wednesday night at 7.30, our midweek service, and we're invited back. Junior Church also meets on Wednesday night. And then Sunday school next Sunday at 10 o'clock. And then our vacation Bible school is June the 17th through the 21st, 6 o'clock until 9 p.m. each uh, from ma Monday through Friday. And the ages 3 to the 8th grade. Sign-ups are in the, uh, uh, for the children are in the lobby. And then the Cage Cove Youth Camp. July the 8th through the 13th, and the sign-ups are in the lobby. And the election coming up August the 25th, we'll be looking out four new deacons, so be praying about that. And then the Cultivate Marriage Conference in Gatlinburg, September the 26th through the 28th, sign-ups are in the lobby also. We have several special requests tonight. We want to pray for the Papala family tonight. We want to pray for Tony Friddle, Becky Friddle, his wife, Danny Hawkins, Joe Bouchek, and Clarette Sims, I got to fellowship with her a little bit. I was in the hospital when her son went home to be with the Lord, and I missed her then. But uh, we got to talk a little bit while ago. That's the nicest lady I've ever met. And Mrs. Sims, I tell you, we're praying for you. We love you from the depth of our heart. And I appreciate the good words she gave me. She's concerned about me. What about it? Going through what she's going through, and yet she's concerned about her preacher. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that. And then Rachel Jackson and Melinda Hawkins. All right, Usher, you may come. We'll receive the tithes and offerings, and you give tonight as the Lord has blessed you. God is good. We've got a lot of folk out, gone, cruising around wherever, all over the world. But we're glad you're here, and I'm glad God's here. Jack, lead us in a word of prayer. Yes. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, God, we come to you now just thanking you and praising you for the sweet Holy Spirit that comes down and visits us, Lord. We praise you for what we felt tonight already in the service. We just ask that you continue to be with us. Bless our pastor, Lord, as he comes in a few moments. Lord, uh, the families that he mentioned here, uh, we know that uh, they need our prayers, Lord, and we pray for each and every one of them, Lord, that you just uh, reach down and supply that need, whatever the need might be, Father. 
Bless our choir and your musicians. We pray for them, Lord. Brother Sammy, as he leads them. Amen. Then, Father, as this money we're about to receive tonight, we just want to praise you and thank you for it. And above all, we want to thank you for reaching down one day and saving our souls from a devil's hell. And Lord, we praise you again for what you're doing and what you've done. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Yes. Amen. Amen. Ask the dear Savior what he had purchased for me when at Calvary he died for all. Just said that he would provide every need supplied, every need supplied.
gets better than that, we'll have to be in glory. I'll tell you, that's a blessing to my soul tonight. I appreciate it, ladies, for the good singing. Appreciate the choir. Appreciate Sammy. Appreciate these musicians. Thank God for what God has given us here at our church. And I just thank Him for every day for what He's done, what He's doing, and what He's going to do because we're serving a living God. I want you to turn for a few minutes tonight to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, and this is on page 1214 in the old Schofield Bible, page 1214. 1 Corinthians 3, verse number 9. The Bible says right here, for, we're all, for we are laborers together with God. What a statement that is. What a truth that is. That's bigger than the world, friend. We're co-laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereupon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Now we have considered lately the uh, fact of, and our, of being a dutiful person we have a duty to perform for God, and that is being a fisher of men. We preached about that last week. And then this morning we talked about and considered the joy of bringing in our sheaves, bringing our sheaves with us, weeping for a while, but joy comes. Weeping is here and now at times, but joy is out there. Matter of fact, some of that joy is here tonight. I feel it in my own heart right now. And so it's all right to be happy and rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it is amazing that there are many metaphors in the Bible that refer to the church. Now, you folk have gotten me kind of disturbed tonight, fearfully, and so I'll have to be, you'll have to bear with me. I try to hold back my tears. I try to hold back my emotion, but I can't worship that way. I just have to turn it loose and let it do what it wants to do. And then, praise God, to, uh, suffer the consequences or whatever. I'll have to just uh, do the best I can. But lately, we have concerted some of these metaphors that I've been talking about. For instance, we are his, talking about the church now, talking about the church that he died for, he loved, gave himself for. We are his sheep, we are his light, we are his habitation, we are his servant, we are his body, we are his garden, we are his family, we are his soldier, we are his pilgrim. We are His city. We are His house. We are His temple. Now we're His building. Man, all of that, that's, that's not all. That's not all that you and I are before God tonight. So don't feel sorry for yourself and don't let anybody ever intimidate you because of your religion. And I'm not talking about mere religion. I'm talking about salvation by grace. Paul mentioned grace right here in this context. It's the grace of God that brought us here. It's the grace of God that brought us from where we were to where we are now. And you have a right, praise God, to praise God. And so that's what we do. Now I want you to notice several things about this building. 
First of all, we have the builders. Now, God is the great architect. And I have used uh, my imagination sitting, studying this about this building. I was here whenever I, uh, we built this building. And, uh, and it's amazing what goes into building a building. But you know, God is the great architect. And every building that's worth being built has an architect. Matter of fact, if you build anything, you've got to have an architect because you've got to have plans, you've got to have ideas and things you don't know anything about or I don't know anything about. But the code uh, that we have, and I used to say, you know, the code, I may browbeat it a little bit, but after you start building your own building, and then somebody may cut a corner, and then the code catches it, and the code says, no, you can't do it that way. And the code makes them do it right. So the code is what you've got to go by when you build a building. And the code will not let you do just anything to a building if you're going to use it for people. I remember this particular land that we're on right now. It had to have that compaction uh, test all around the whole place before they could pour a footing, before they could pour a footing to put the other things on top of the foundation. My friend, they had to have all of that approved of and signed off on before we could do anything else. Well, I learned to appreciate the code because nobody could cheat me, nobody could trick me because I didn't know everything or anything much about building a building like this. I built a chicken coop. I built a fence around a hog lot, stuff like that. But I don't know much about building a building like this, but I had somebody to watch out for me. Brother, God's got a code. We've got to follow God's code, code if we're going to be all right for Him in the spiritual realm. Now, my friend, we have this architect. God is the chief architect. And my friend, he is the one in charge. He's the one that plans, and he's the one that devises. He's the one that directs. And, of course, Jesus said, I will build my church. I will build my church. I'm thankful tonight that I belong to an organism that's not made by man. I'm glad no man with all of his education, with all of his expertise, did not build what I'm a member of. He didn't build God's church. Jesus did. He said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know why the church keeps going? When it's tormented, when it's persecuted, when people curse it, when people hate it, and it just keeps on thriving, it keeps on going, because it's built by the right one for the right people. And brother, you and I can shout victory tonight for what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are building for God, and God planned it all before the foundation of the world. Now, you may not understand that, but you have to believe in a sovereign God, or you can't be happy in Jesus. You've got to believe that God knows everything, knew everything. He knew I'd be preaching tonight before I was ever born. Hallelujah. He's an all-knowing God. So we have the architect, but then we have the artistry because we have a firm foundation and that is a foundation that cannot be moved. It cannot sink. It cannot fail. It cannot break apart. This is a solid foundation on whom we stand. First Corinthians right here, 3 and verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay, that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. People have religion. They've got religions all over the world, all kinds of religions, all kinds of doctrines. The Pharisees were studying in our Sunday school lesson had their traditions and they put it ahead of God. They didn't have God in their heart. But there are religions out there, but they're not built on this foundation. And I'm not talking about the foundation of the Baptist. I'm not talking about the foundation of the Methodist or the Presbyterian or the Church of God or the Charismatic or the Catholic or the Mormons or the Islamic or anybody. It's not built on any of them. Built on Jesus Christ. Jesus is the foundation on which we are to build if we are to have any rewards in glory one day. Now salvation is not a reward. Salvation is a free gift. God gave us salvation through the blood of Jesus freely. And my friend, you don't buy it. You don't pay for it. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. Hallelujah. He gave it in the grace of God. So, my friend, we have the architect, we have the artistry, and then we have the ability. Verse number 10, 
according to the grace of God. Paul said, and God told Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. Paul, going through some things, had a thorn in the flesh. Asked God three times to remove it. God didn't. But God said, my grace is sufficient for you. How many times have you said a prayer to God and it didn't come through or didn't come through like you thought it ought to? Well, don't get upset. There's some things that God knows you don't know. There's some things that God will let you go through that will help you later on. God's running this thing. He's leading us. And, boy, you have sung tonight. Glory to God. The old rugged cross, it did it all. It's all we need, praise God, Calvary, where the Lamb of God bled and died for your sin and mine. And now we're saved, we're sealed, we're sanctified, and we're ready to meet Jesus any time that He comes. I'm happy tonight. What about you? Are you happy with your religion? If you say, my religion doesn't give me that satisfaction, get out of it. Brother Jesus will take care of everything. He'll give you peace like a river flowing in your soul. He'll give you joy unspeakable and full of glory. He'll take care of your need. A spiritual, a spiritual person will have to trust God totally and completely and not look to self. So we have the ability. It's according to the grace of God. We can't do a lot of things, but by the grace of God we can. We all become a part of the building, but more than that, we become builders also. Boy, we get all kinds of involvement here. God uses us for everything that pleases Him. Paul was a true builder in the work of God and in the work of the church, which belongs exclusively to Jesus Christ. Now, our text says right here, Paul said, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth their own. Verse number 10, the church is a working and workable entity. It is a working entity church. So we have the architect, we have the artistry, we have the ability, we have the applicant, and then we know right here concerning this that you got a preacher. God chose preaching. He chose preaching to save those that believe. Now that's foolish to the world. Foolishness to the world, but to those of us who are saved, it's the power of God. So he has a preacher. He is to build. That preacher is to build. Paul said he was a builder, and he said we build upon what he built. He built upon the doctrine of the apostles and prophets, which were the prophets of God, the prophets of God, the people of God that taught the things of God. And Paul did not contradict not one of God's prophets. He didn't say, well, he was wrong, I'm right. No, he built on that foundation what they said, what they preached, what they prophesied. And brother, passed on down to this very day in 2024, we're sitting here. We are standing on the same foundation. We're in the same building they were in, that they belonged to by faith, and that Paul preached and built on. So he said, another man builds on that. In Ephesians 4.11, and he gave some apostles. God gave some apostles and some <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. The pastors and teachers are one and the same. They're together right there, no separation. For the perfecting, here it is, for the perfecting of the saints. That doesn't mean that I am so perfect, and I'm the example of perfection, and I'm going to get you to live like I say live, and you'll be perfect. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about a godly preacher that preaches like he's supposed to. He will help the church become mature. They'll grow in the Lord. Ron and I were talking about things, you know, that we didn't know years ago, but now we've learned some of those things. How? By going through the Word of God, studying the Word of God, going to church. And, you know, uh, these little kids, we also talk about the kids. When I get out of here on Sunday school, I go through there and get a drink of water, and I go to several of the classes, usually, if I can, and <clears throat> those little kids will thrill you to death. They'll tell you what they're doing. And, look, I got this preacher. This is my Sunday school class thing, and it just absolutely moves me. It does. And that's why I say every parent ought to have his kids in Sunday school. And every parent ought to be in Sunday school. I mean, it's that important, and one day you'll see it. But don't wait till late until you say, oh, I wish I had taken advantage 
of going to church. I wish I had taken advantage of going to Sunday school and listening to the Word of God being taught. I would to God that I hadn't done what I did. I wish I had not let all of that go. Now I, I could use it. I could use it, but I have not retained it. I have not received it. I didn't go. I didn't go like I should. But he said right here, pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, that word edifying means to build up now, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You are the body of Christ. Now when you go out here and work all week long and you have experience after experience and you have these kinds of people that you meet, different kinds, some of them are friendly, some of them are not. Some of them are in favor of you. Some of them don't like you. Some of them will ridicule you and say evil things about you. But anyway, you're going to rub shoulders with the devil's crowd every week. <clears throat> well, you fought the fight. You fought all week long, and you made it to church. Thank God I made it to church. All right. Now, if a preacher is not wise and not spiritual, he'll get up here and browbeat you to death. Brow beat you today, and you just fought the devil all week. Now you've got to fight the preacher. He's just tearing you apart. He's telling you you're no good, and you've got to do this and dress this way and look this way and all that. He just hammers on you. I think he's unwise that way. I believe when you come in here, the Bible says that the preacher is to edify. That means build up. The devil told you, you know, try to make you doubt your salvation during the week when you come in here. You better not leave here doubting your salvation. Don't you leave here doubting your salvation. You don't have to. You're a fool if you do. Praise God. Claim it. Hey, stretch him. Hey, stay true to your faith uh, and believe him uh, no matter what. And Brother Steve and I were talking a little bit ago about it's so good, you know, when we do fail. And it's not good to fail, but we do fail. But when, it, when we do fail, that doesn't, that doesn't hinder our salvation, not one iota. <sighs> Glory. Doesn't hinder my salvation. The devil and all hell cannot take my salvation away. Cannot hinder it. Cannot, cannot diminish it one way. No matter what you and I do, salvation is eternal. Eternal. Once you ask Jesus into your heart by faith and you get born again, you're his child. I mean, you know, I'm born of my parents, Wilton K. and Rose K. I could, I could deny my daddy. I could say, that ain't my daddy. I could deny my mama and say, that ain't my mama. But they are. But they are. I may hate them. I may turn against them. I may cuss them. I may say, I don't belong to you and all the rest of that. But I can't change the fact I'm Wilton K.'s son. I'm Wilton K.'s son. Well, I'm going to tell you something. You're not going to curse God and all that. But you do make mistakes. But you'll never become anything other than a child of God if you've ever become a child of God. It's eternal, eternal. Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. You going to take his word or the word of all the other uh, crumbs out here? But he said, edifying the body of Christ till we all, all of us, come how? In the unity. You know what unity is? Togetherness into the unity of the faith, the faith, and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, that's a mature person now, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, tossed to and fro, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, the wind blows, doesn't it, all the time. And the wind, I'm talking about spiritual wind, and it tries to blow up off course, tries to get us to do something that's not really what's right. But whenever you're grounded in Jesus now, that won't happen. You won't get off course. You won't be blown about. Some people believe one thing one Sunday, and the next Sunday they change believe another thing. Some people believe one denomination one Sunday, and the next time you know they're in another denomination. Somebody said that they used to be a Baptist, but, but they became a, uh, another denomination. I forget which it was now, a Jehovah's Witness or something. I said, yeah, yeah, a Baptist can become a Jehovah's Witness, but not a Christian. A Christian cannot belong and cannot become a Jehovah's Witness. A Christian cannot become a cult. A Christian will always be a Christian no matter what they are in. 
no matter what denomination they're in. But you've got to be born again, Jesus said. So we're not tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men uh, who are cunning, craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Boy, there are millions out there wanting to deceive the church. They want to deceive you. You'll meet people all along the way that want to deceive you, get you off course. Don't you believe old Sammy K now? Don't you believe him? He'll lead your soul to hell. He believes in that old once saved, always saved. He believes in that eternal security. You better not go over there. How many people have told people in this community or in this town that about me? I've heard it. I've heard them. I've heard where people say they told me to stay with you. I had one friend, and Sammy's sitting here. He knows I'm telling the truth. A good friend now, good friend of another denomination. He'd come over here after listening to our television program, and he would say, Brother, I heard you preach today. That was some good preaching. This is him now. He said, That's some good preaching. I, I'm telling you, I enjoyed that. And then he'd go right out here to two of my converts, and he would tell them, You better not go over there to Sammy Case Church. He believes in that eternal security kind. He'll lead your soul to hell. Now, he just told me I was a great preacher. Now he's out there backbiting me. Well, what does he have? Nothing. Nothing. He is a hypocrite. My friend, I thought the world of him and all of that, but he was in another denomination, and I was on my way of getting him out if I could, but he died. He went to heaven if he was saved. And so he'll be in heaven even though he was a critic and didn't believe the right thing all the way. But thank God you've got people that'll do you that way. But don't you change, don't you change, don't you let anybody deceive you. God said, don't let any man deceive you by any means. They'll cry every way they can. Now the true preacher builds the church in truth and in love. Now if you don't love, it's not because of me, because I love you. I've told you, and I've told you, and I mean it. I love you. I don't hate anybody. I love everybody here. Now I really do. And if God could open my heart, He could show you that I'm not lying. I love you from the depths of my heart. So He loves. And then He leads His people to love. He teaches His people to love and to obey the Lord Jesus who is the head, the one that's supervising, the one that's leading, the one that started it all. In Ephesians 4, 16, from whom the whole body, the whole body, fitly joined together, and compacted by that which every joint supply according to the effectual working in the measure of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Hey, when you get to really obeying God, I won't have to tell you you ought to love everybody. It'll just absolutely come. You'll just start loving everybody back and forth. you love each other with a real deep heartfelt love. Because you, and then that edifies you. Boy, I'm telling you, you talk about building up, getting spiritual, getting happy, you'll be happy. So the preacher must really labor until the building is finished. He has no leave he, until he dies or becomes disabled. He has to preach unto God until it's over, till his life is over. You don't give up, you don't give in. So his work must be able to bear the heartaches, and, and to do what uh, Jesus said, because see, he's the headstone. And so we've got to build a building that will support the headstone. And if we don't build right, we can't support the headstone. Upon this foundation rests the weight of every born-again child of God that's ever been saved by the grace of God. So you have the preacher, then you have the preacher's workers, our text says in chapter 3, verse 10, according to the grace of God which is given unto me, I am a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereupon. So Paul was a perfect example of building for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he dared not build upon anything else or anybody else or any other foundation. It was Jesus. Boy, you know, Paul was a champion for Jesus. Boy, I'm telling you, when he got saved, he got saved. When he got converted, he changed all the way around. So we're not only workers, but we are also materials, materials in the building. The Bible says that we're called living stones because we're saved. And no other worker receives rewards 
for building except the church, the true church. You know, a sinner, he can get up there and work, give his money, he can pray, he can talk, he can go to his religion and all the rest and just keep on sacrificing. And he can burn himself at the stake. That won't gain him one little place in glory. He must be born again. Ye must be born again. So if you're not born again, you're lost. Now this is not me being condemnatory. This is me preaching the Word of God. Jesus told a very religious man, Nicodemus, ye must be born again. He was a Pharisee. He was one that had religion, but he was lost until he got born again. No other material is suitable for this building but a born-again believer. Judgment is coming one day. Materials of wood, hay, and stubble will be burned at the judgment seat of Christ. So we are not saved by works, but it is ordained that we bring forth good fruit. And so the Bible says that we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God before ordained that we should walk in them. So unsaved people can be added to a local church roll. I mean, we could go out here and open that computer and start putting names in there, whether they're saved or not. That won't save them. That doesn't save them. They can be on the, the roll of every church in Greenville and be lost. But when you get on His roll, that's the one that counts. That's the only one that matters about eternity. If you don't want to go to hell, then you want to go to heaven, then that's the roll you want to be on, and you get that by believing Jesus as Savior and personal Savior that is. All right, 1 Corinthians 3.13, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive what? Salvation? No, he's already got salvation. He's building. All right, what shall he receive? A reward. What kind of reward would that be? You know, people give out awards. I saw somebody on a sports program the other night. I didn't see the sports program, but I saw him hand him a great big old uh, trophy. He had won. Boy, people went wild. They went wild over a piece of metal, silver, gold, or whatever. They were just a clapping and a carrying on something off. I thought, I wouldn't have that thing. I wouldn't take up my, no room in my house with that blooming thing. But I got a reward, praise God, over there. I got a reward over there that will make that thing look like it didn't even exist. Now, I'm not against all of that as far as the world being able to do it. Help yourself. But I'm saying, for personally, I didn't care a thing about it. I wouldn't have it. But they were happy about it. That's fine. If you got anything going for you, be happy about it. I believe in that. And, brother, you know, rejoice about it. But don't count on any of that. When you get to heaven, it won't, it won't matter then. So the preacher must preach the one true gospel of salvation. Sinners must receive that gospel or be lost. He becomes a living stone in the building when he gets saved. He builds according to the chief architect's words and ways and advice and leadership. So you have the preacher, you have the workers, but then you have the qualifications of that preacher. What qualifies him? A certain degree, a lot of degrees, a high education, or whatever the world offers? Is that what qualifies him? That may help him in a lot of ways, but that's not the qualification of being a good preacher. It's the Spirit of God. I remember some old preachers told us in school one time, now we're not going to teach you how to preach. If God doesn't call you to preach, you're out. I can't call you. No man can call you. We're going to teach you how to study the Bible so you can relate, rightly divide the word of truth if you are God's preacher. But you're going to have to preach as the Holy Spirit leads you. We're not the Spirit. I thought, well, now I'll remember that the rest of my life because I already believe that. I don't believe a man that's right with God uh, is, is uh, just a man-made thing or a mama called, daddy sent. I believe he's called of God, and I believe that. I believe as surely as I'm here <coughs> that God called me. One night in my front bedroom, I surrendered to him. In 1 Corinthians 3.18, let no man deceive himself of any, of any, if any man, if any man among you seemeth 
to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. So if you think your wisdom, worldly wisdom is it, you better become a fool over those things and get wise in the things of God. Troublemakers. Troublemakers come along every now and then, and they're a great hindrance to the building of God. And they think more highly of themselves than they ought. They make foolish claims through self-centered pride. They are always finding some kind of fault with the preacher and with the deacons, with the church. And of course, they, they are building themselves something here, but they're not building in the building for God. So, they lack, they lack wisdom. They need wisdom. They need knowledge. They're born of both, and they need that. So they are ignorant of the order of the architect. Now, whenever they put this little trailer out here, when they were building this building, I went out there and tried to learn to read the blueprints. Boy, I tell you, it looked like a bunch of hens scratching, you know. I just couldn't tell one pipe from another or one electric wire from another. But we got me in here right now that can read blue, blueprints and, and do all kinds of work like that. And so we're... We're just, we admire them. We're glad we have those kinds of men in our church. But I couldn't read those. But I tell you what, old Carlos took me there and showed me a lot of things. And I began to learn. And if I'd have had a lot more time, I'd have probably learned how to read those blueprints. But I had sense enough to know you, you had to follow those blueprints or something would be off. Something would be wrong. Well, God's got a blueprint. And if you don't follow God's blueprint, friends, something's going to be off. So you better wake up. We should all realize today that we are God's workmanship, and we are His created in Christ Jesus, <clears throat> that y'all talked about and sang about. Preachers, workers, qualifications, the motives. 1 Corinthians 3, right here, verse 9. For we are laborers together. And this is the text. For we are laborers together with God. Now, we talked about fishers of men. We talked about our sheaves, bringing our sheaves with us when we go out and gather the grain. All right? What gives you an incentive to do that? I mean, you think I'm going to go out here and talk to people about God? What can, what can motivate me? I don't have any motivation. I'm scared. I'm, a ner I'm nervous. I can't talk very well. You know what will motivate you? Is to realize that God went with you and will go with you. Yeah. God goes with you. When we used to go on visitation on uh, Thursday night, We'd always pray before we left. Now we're going out to witness now, and God is with us. And we won souls to the Lord that way. <clears throat> so then, if this was just a man-made thing, I wouldn't be eager to go out either. But this is not a man-made thing. We are laborers together with God, with Him, not apart from Him. So we are promised success. We are content and happy. We are thankful for the call God put on us. And we are excited in the Spirit. The Spirit is real. He's here. He's here this morning. He's here tonight. He'll be here forever. He's everywhere present. That's why we feel good. That's why we shed tears of joy. That's why we say hallelujah and praise the Lord. Now these uh, are things that motivate us. And I'm going to tell this before I close. You know we had a gentleman here years ago that got into glory. And he ran around this building, came down that aisle. Now, that's a steep place right there. And came around, got off balance, and fell, and skinned his nose, blooded his nose a little bit. All right? It hacked him. It embarrassed him. He wrote me a nice letter the next week and apologized and said, I must have not been in the spirit or I would not have fallen like that. And I wrote him a letter back, and I said, Brother, don't you apologize for that. You were trying to praise God the best you knew how. And you know what? The devil didn't like it. And probably the devil stuck his foot out and tripped you, for all I know. Hey, and tried to make a fool out of you. But I tell you what, next time you come to this church and you feel like doing it again, go ahead and do it again. I may join you. If I ain't going to fall on my nose, I hope. I tell you right now, but by the grace of God, I shout, I got old Steve and Randall one day to ruin. Boy, I'll tell you, that was a good day. I don't ever forget that. Steve hadn't been a member here but a few weeks. But I said, come on, Randall, come on, Steve. Boy, we ran around. That's the first time I've ever run around this field, and I reckon, in my life. But don't rule it out. Don't rule it out. The older I get, the better I run. <laughs> yeah, slower, shorter steps, all right. 
But Ann said the other day, she said, you know, I notice you're walking a lot slower. Boy, bless her little heart. She's been with me 60-something years. She ought to see me getting slow because I am. So this is important to all professed Christians is that we do what the Bible says and build this building. Now then, this architect, the artistry, the ability, the applicant, and then the application. The application is, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Let every man take heed how he builds. Are you building for God? Is your heart right? If not, it ought to be right. And if you're here tonight and you're not saved, this altar is open. I got the Bible, and we'll show you how to be saved tonight. You leave here saved on your way to heaven. Member, visitor, it doesn't matter who you are. Let's stand to our feet. Our Father in heaven, thank you for this night, for this morning. Thank you for the way you blessed this morning and then tonight. And thank you, Father, for the great, great truth that we have of Calvary. Lord, the precious blood that was shed on Calvary covers it all. Oh, Lord, we preached on that not long ago. Calvary covers it all. And, Lord, it does. It does. And we thank you tonight. Now I pray thy blessing upon our church. I pray that all of us together will join together in our spirit and say, I'm going to do the best I can to build.